Welcome back to Banter, a policy podcast from the American Enterprise Institute in Washington, D.C. I'm Spencer Moore. And I'm Cece Gallagher. And Cece, the topic of today's show is the Senate filibuster. I've been in the news quite a bit recently. That's right. It's a hard one for me because filibuster is like a senator's dog in my mind. You know, like filibuster, not in the petunias. Like if there was a Senator Gallagher, you would have a dog name. Yes. If the people of the United States made the grave mistake of electing me (laughs) to the Senate, yes, my dog would be named filibuster. Well, that's good. Um, We're not talking about your hypothetical dog filibuster. We're talking about the use of the filibuster over time. It's gotten a lot of attention, especially with the recent healthcare debate and also the tax reform debate. President Trump has tweeted about it multiple times, wants to get rid of it. That's right. He's called it archaic. Archaic. Speaker Ryan last night on Sean Hannity's show also mentioned the dysfunction in the Senate and mentioned the filibuster. But Senator McConnell is just not having it. He wants to keep it. He thinks it's part of the institution. It's got to stay. That's right. He does want to keep it. And who do we have on the show to discuss the filibuster? Today we have James Walner, who's a senior fellow of the R Street Institute, where he studies Congress, particularly the Senate. Formerly, he was vice president for research at the Heritage Foundation. Also on the show, we have Peter Hansen, who's an assistant professor of political science at Grinnell College and a specialist in American politics, where he teaches courses on constitutional law and American political institutions. That's right. And Professor Hansen actually worked for Senator Tom Daschle up on the Hill. And Dr. Walner worked for Senate Republicans in a couple of committees and congressional offices. So it's a good mix and a balance between Republican and Democrat on today's show to discuss this important issue. I know that we're looking forward to having both of them on the show. But for now, let's take a brief break and then we'll be right back with our guests, Peter Hansen and James Walner. Hi, I'm Andy Smerick. And I'm John Bailey. We're the hosts of the New Skills Marketplace podcast on the AEI podcast channel. In this podcast series, we're exploring new and innovative approaches to education, human capital development, and preparation for the workforce. We're having conversations with leaders in secondary and post-secondary education, philanthropy and nonprofit sectors, research and policy communities, and others. We're asking how can educators, employers, and entrepreneurs work to serve all of our citizens, young and old, so they possess the skills, information, habits, and support necessary to succeed in the world of work. We hope you'll join us. Please subscribe to the AEI Podcast channel on the AEI Podcast Network on iTunes or your podcast platform of choice. Thanks so much for listening. And we are back with our guests today, Peter Hansen and James Walner. Thank you both for being here. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having us. Yes, of course. So the filibuster has been in the news quite a bit recently, but the filibuster is not new. So why don't we start with what are the history of the filibuster? Was this thing created when the Senate was created, or how has it changed over time, and how has it developed? Well, the filibuster is not established by the Constitution. It simply emerged out of the rules of the Senate. Uh, very early on in the Senate's history, they abolished um, a motion for a previous question, which would have allowed them to end debate. And so there was no no formal way to end debate in the Senate. And uh, Senators uh, over time took advantage of that fact and starting in the 19th century used that ability to delay matters or seek advantages as they saw fit. And that's just continued to uh, develop really since since that time. And uh, I think what we've noticed today is it's uh, being used a particularly large amount. uh, And that's one of the reasons why I think it's uh, being looked at right now. Um, But I think the important thing is it wasn't You know, it's not part of the Constitution. This is uh, something that evolved out of the writing of the Senate rules. Uh, Yeah, that's right. And look, the the filibuster as it exists today certainly wasn't around at the beginning, right? But if you look at what's happening in the Senate today, it doesn't seem to me that the filibuster is the problem. The problem is that we have senators who aren't debating, who don't want to vote, who don't want to do things. And that's a really big problem because at the end of the day, you're not reforming health care. You may not be able to pass tax reform. You're not doing much of anything. And for people that work hard to get to Washington, that's got to be a very disappointing thing. And the filibuster, it seems to me, just isn't the reason why that's happening. Well, James, I think that's a great point. I mean, I think one of the questions we always have to ask is, what exactly is the source of the problem? Are the procedures the problem or the politics the problem? And uh, fundamentally, what we're facing today, I think, is the fact that uh, the nation is deeply divided over a number of issues. Those are genuinely hard to resolve. Um, Congress assembles, of course, in an effort to to do that, but that's a challenging task. And, and so um, we're not simply facing procedural problems. I mean, I think if you got rid of the filibuster, we would still continue to face problems. 
And so it's important to make that distinction. Now, James, you mentioned healthcare, So that's one of the reasons why this filibuster question is getting more complicated. Recently, Republicans tried to pass the bill through the reconciliation process. How did the threat of the filibuster post-reconciliation impact the debate? People talk about the threat of the filibuster as somehow constraining and, and limiting what um, Republicans could do by forcing them into reconciliation. And that may be the case. It may have limited them. But we don't know for sure. I think what we do know is that the Republican Party was much more deeply divided on health care than they ever have, uh, any of us ever expected. And the reason why we never expected it is because the Senate's not working. There's no process. There's no debate. And I think this gets back to the fundamental underlying problem, which is we don't have enough conflict in our politics. We don't have enough conflict in the Senate. If you had debates where people had to filibuster health care proposals, vote on amendments, guess what? You would see the senators falling along the lines that they did during the health care debate with reconciliation. And we would not have been so surprised. There's a criticism that's often levied on the House that the bill drafting process is too leadership driven. Is, that, is there a similar issue with that in the Senate? Well, I think in both chambers, you hear folks calling for uh, what's known as regular order. Yeah. And uh, that is a textbook legislative process where bills go through committee, uh, and then they go to the floor for debate and amendment. Um, you know, one thing I, I think that's important to recognize about that is um, uh, there are two things at play here. I mean, one is how do you deliberate on, on bills? But the second is to recognize that what they're calling for really is a decentralization of power. Um, it's a redistribution of power in the two chambers, and um, I think that's why it's it's been uh, somewhat controversial and also why we haven't actually seen repeated pledges to return to regular order actually manifest. Uh, it's a much harder ask than I think those members are acknowledging uh, because when push comes to shove, what people care about are their policy preferences, and uh, I think they care about more, more about those than they do about the particular procedure that leads to those policies. I think that's a great point, Peter. And this really gets back to the idea of conflict, because when you view conflict as a bad thing, right, something to be avoided, then you develop processes that will allow you to get around it. And so when you have a committee markup, and regular order can mean lots of things, but for the most part, people think it means you have a committee markup, you have hearings, members vote on bills and amendments that goes to the floor, you vote on bills and amendments that goes over to the House, and so on and so on, you know, schoolhouse rock stuff. But when you view that, when you view conflict over issues about which we are deeply divided is a bad thing, you ultimately will design processes to avoid it, which means no regular order, no committee markups, no floor debate. And when you do that, there's only one logical place to go, and that's the leadership. And so the leadership will take controversial issues, and they'll get key people and they will get in a room and they'll write a bill and they'll do their best to solve the problem. But last time I checked, man is fallible. They do not know everything. They are not all knowing and all powerful. And no one person or group of people is going to be able to solve the issues that this country faces. And the only way to do that on things like health care, taxes and other issues is to use the institutions and the processes that our founders and the framers of the Constitution have given us. It's part of the issue that when a bill is introduced, when leadership has put a bill together, as complex as healthcare or as complex as tax reform, that if they don't feel like they have 100% consensus of their party's members, that the bill is dead on arrival? Well, I don't know that I would characterize the legislation as being dead on arrival. I think there are two other issues at stake. The first is that if you bring a, a bill to the floor under a procedure that allows any member to offer an amendment, you are essentially giving up control over the content of the legislation. Members of the majority will offer amendments. Members of the minority will offer amendments. Some of those are going to win. And so oftentimes the majority party is unwilling to concede control over the contents of legislation. Mm -hmm. I think the second issue is that we have seen a rise in recent years of members forcing votes on politically painful issues. Um, and these votes are, are really designed to cause damage uh, during campaigns rather than spark a genuine policy debate. And so I think those two issues have often made leaders reluctant to bring legislation to the floor. That doesn't mean they don't do it. I think if you look at appropriations bills, which are the bills that fund the federal government, you know, until very recently, the House brought those to the floor under conditions that allowed any member to offer an amendment. And the result was that there was a genuine bipartisan debate. Uh, the minority won some of those votes. The majority won some of those votes. Both sides lost some. 
But that kind of give and take is rare now. And even on appropriations bills, uh, it's become scarce as leadership has started to crack down on debate. Can we dig in a little bit on the budget process? I know you mentioned in your book, Peter, your book, Too Weak to Govern, that the filibuster creates an intractable issue when it comes to the budget process. Can you explain why? Sure. Well, uh, one of the challenges the Senate has when it debates appropriations bills is that members do have the opportunity to offer as many amendments as they want, and they have the opportunity to filibuster legislation. I think one of the things that's happened in the Senate, and this is not recently, my book covers a 40-year time period, and, and I document this going on way back into the 1980s, um, is that when a bill comes to the floor, it does face these politically painful uh, amendments. Uh, it is It can be filibustered at times. One consequence of this is that Senate leaders have become reluctant to bring appropriations bills to the floor. So there is an irony here. I think the filibuster, which is intended to protect unlimited debate, um, has led leaders to avoid the floor and thus uh, limit debate indirectly. So um, members are losing the opportunity to to debate bills in that respect. And I think that's certainly part of it. I think another thing that people overlook, though, is the Budget Control Act. Right, that allowed for the Congress and President Obama at the time in August of 2011 to raise the debt ceiling. And it placed caps on discretionary spending, both defense and non-defense. And to say that members of Congress in both parties were unenthused about those caps, I think would be a, a, a gross understatement. And I think those caps, it seems to me, in recent years, more than the filibuster, have led to a, uh, a paralysis on the appropriations process because the Democrats will you know, to simplify things, filibuster the defense appropriations bill, not because they want to block the, the spending on the Pentagon, but because they want to use it as leverage to get money for non-defense stuff, for their priorities. Republicans will then, in turn, block or not bring up, if they're in the majority, the non-defense bills to get leverage on the defense side. And this is what's really causing this problem. Um, more than the filibuster per se. Look, Rule 19, it allows for a talking filibuster to be enforced on the motion to proceed to get on a bill. There's no reason why you can't get on a bill in the Senate. And they have plenty of time. Last time I checked, they're not doing anything these days. They could rent out the chamber on Airbnb, make a little bit of extra money. We could use it for model UNs. Maybe AI could have a new program where we could go all and act like senators there because they're not using the floor, right? So, So you should put things on the floor and force people to stand up and talk. And guess what? They're only going to talk for so long because you you can't talk forever. And if you are forced to talk for 10 hours to filibuster something that may not be that important, the next time you may only want to talk for two hours. And then next time it may be one. My guess is there's very few senators who will actually stand up and give a 10-hour speech to block the, you know, the, the, the bill on the transportation department, right? I mean, that, there's not that many. But what we've done is we're allowing them to veto things. So what we do now is we go, if you're in the majority and you go to the minority and you say, hey, guys, can we, can we debate this bill on the floor? Well, they say no, because you just asked them. If instead you just go to the floor and say, we're going to debate this bill, guess what? They're going to have to stand up and block it. And that's a hard thing to do. And I think we underestimate how hard that is. Is that a common misconception that the most typical filibuster is the talking filibuster? Is that more rare than we think? It's actually very uncommon. Uh, you know, most filibusters uh, take the form of, of a hold, uh, which is simply a senator indicating that they will not allow uh, anything to proceed on a bill um, until they give the go ahead. Now, that can be broken by um, having a cloture vote on it, but that takes time, floor time. Uh, although you're right, they're not using the floor as much as they could. You know, members regard floor time as precious. They're not there that much. And so leaders are reluctant um, to hold those kind of votes. They're going to have to start coming to work before noon on Mondays That's and right. staying through Thursday, right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> so uh, those kind of holds are effective filibusters. Yeah, but we need to also remember what the filibuster is. And Peter's absolutely right. The filibuster is simply a, a word that we use to describe when a senator speaks for a very long time, Right. And in the Senate, there's no previous question motion, which Peter um, alleged to earlier, which means that you can't end debate, right? The chair can put the question whenever the chair wants to, but under the Senate's rules, the chair has to stop. The roll call vote stops if a senator stands up and says, I'd like to speak. Mm. And so basically they shortcut that process by saying, is anybody going to object to this if we have a vote? And then that's known as unanimous consent. And that's why we think of it as a veto, but it's not a veto. And then the Senate rules, as I just alluded to, also put limits on how many times you can speak on given questions. And there's all sorts of other things that you can do to make it difficult to obstruct in the Senate. The problem is those things take work and they take effort. And as I said at the beginning, we have senators in both parties who are uninterested in putting in that effort and doing that work 
to get their preferred outcome. It's a lot easier to do it this way. And last time I checked, it's a universal human trait to get what you want and, and want to do that without any effort. And that's what's happening right now. And so people look around for silver bullets, like, let's get rid of the filibuster. Let's empower the majority. But none of that's going to fix this underlying problem, which is the Senate itself isn't working as a, as a body for legislative debate and voting. So let's go back to 2013. Democrats did change the rules for the filibuster, um, allowing executive branch appointments to go through with a simple majority. What kind of prompted that? What was the history of that? Well, that's a great question. You know, the politics of judicial nominations have grown increasingly contentious since the 1980s as the parties have grown farther apart. Uh, they have perceived the stakes as being higher in allowing the opposing party to uh, win any of those judicial nominations. And, and so we saw both parties really trying to slow down the nomination process and make it hard for a president to uh, to carry out that uh, that constitutional duty. So what happened at that time was that uh, Democrats used a procedural backdoor, which is nicknamed the nuclear option, to uh, eliminate the need to get 60 votes or the ability to, for the minority to uh, filibuster those nominations. Uh, the result of that effort was that in the brief period after that and during which Democrats still controlled the Senate, uh, they confirmed a whole lot of nominees. And that stopped then once Republicans took back control of the chamber. And then uh, subsequently, of course, on the last Supreme Court nomination, Republicans followed suit and did the same thing for Supreme Court nominees. My sense is that on, on these issues where, which are different than general legislation, there has been a greater willingness from members to consider limiting the use of the filibuster. Um, they still are very um, protective of that prerogative when it comes to normal bills. Uh, they think they view judges differently and certainly possible they might reconsider that in the future, but I think that's where they are right now. And as for why they did it, I have a bit of a contrarian view. If you take a step back and you look at when the Republicans were in the majority, President Bush was in the White House um, in 2003, 4, and 5. The, and there were certainly, as Peter um, suggested, a rising obstruction of, of nominees on both sides. But the Democrats at the time were obstructing uh, President Bush's judicial nominees. The Republicans didn't like it. There was a big push to use the nuclear option. It never happened. Why not? Because the Democrats threatened to retaliate. They were very explicit about it. And they said, this is what we're going to do if you do that. And what the consequence of that was, was that they basically took away the votes that the Republicans needed to go nuclear. Right? They, they said rank and file members, like, I'm not going to do that. That's too much. And it led to the Gang of 14. Fast forward to 2013, we often hear, well, we have the same amount of obstruction. We have the same amount of obstruction. The Republicans are blocking everything. And then they finally got pushed too far and Reed went down to the floor and the Democrats went nuclear. Well, if you look back, what had happened was that the Democrats had been consistently threatening to go nuclear every time they had a nominee that the Republicans objected to. And what happened? The Republicans backed down or there was a deal to work them out starting in May with um, in June with co committees reporting Gina McCarthy for the EPA, Tom Perez for the Department of Labor. Um, we had uh, NLRB noms for the um, We had the um, CFPB, a whole host of noms. And every time the majority went right up to the brink and enough members of the minority got worried and they and they bolted and they negotiated with the majority. And so that just incentivized them to keep doing it again and again and again. Well, on November 21st, I believe was the date when they finally did it. It came out of nowhere. It was like two days before somebody said, this might actually be happening. I was in the Senate at the time for these D.C. circuit court noms. And I think there was a quote in the press from like a Schumer or a Reid sometime in late October. But that was it. I mean, there was the shutdown, the debt ceiling. It wasn't like there was any idea that this was going to come all of a sudden. And I believe at the end that the Democrats thought that they could do it and get away with it again. And, I, and the Republicans were just fed up. They were tired. And what happened? It just tumbled over. And then they went nuclear. There was no retaliation to follow up to chasten them for doing it. The, you know, they confirmed all of these nominees. The Republicans did not do what they could to retaliate. Um, and I think a lot of this gets to what Peter has said, that a lot of members um, on both the right and the left view the filibuster for judges as something that doesn't apply. The problem with that is the same rule that applies the filibuster to judges also applies it to legislation. And I've got young kids. I know Peter has young kids. And I can't tell them this rule only works in this situation. But in this other situation, it doesn't apply. It weakens the overall rule of law in the Senate. And so that's going to have consequences. And we're going to see it. And it's going to get harder and harder for majorities to tell their supporters, we can't do this because of this, this rule that we have when you're already willing to do it in these other instances. 
How about instead of abolishing the filibuster, we rename the nuclear option? Because I feel like in this North Korea threatening time, having the president tweet about the nuclear option the nuclear is option just is not good. Yeah, unsettling. Keep that in context for sure. <laughs> the president has been tweeting that he wants the Senate to use it, but Mitch McConnell says they're not going to do it. How do you see this debate over Graham Cassidy ending? I mean, I think the, the biggest thing is that they have to be confronted with something that the filibuster is stopping. And the Democrats aren't filibustering anything right now. And on health care, they don't have 51 votes. If it stops taxes and they don't have 51 votes, it doesn't really matter much. If there's a huge push beyond which all of the members of the Republican Party in the Senate are behind, then, yeah, it, they may have a lot of pressure to do so. But as a fact of the matter, right now, I don't see it happening. You know, I think one thing uh, that's helpful to understand about the politics of the filibuster is, you know, we almost always discuss it in, in terms of the power of the minority. Uh, more accurately, the right to unlimited debate and unlimited amendment um, empowers individual senators, both in the majority and the minority. It is where individual members um, receive their power. It allows any individual member to hold up a bill, you know, even if they're in the majority. And we need to remember that not all politics are partisan. There are regional politics. Uh, there are politics over different kinds of economic issues. And so I think when uh, Majority Leader McConnell said he didn't have the votes in his conference to support eliminating the filibuster for general legislation. That's the reason. Members recognize, I think correctly, that it, it is a source of their individual power. And I would also just point out, going back to 2003, 4, and 5, it's not just the majority's decision to eliminate the, the nuclear option, even if they do have the votes at a given moment, because two people can play or two sides get to play. And there's some things the minority can do that you just can't nuke right? The Constitution allows for um, 20 members, a sufficient second of the Senate, so 20, as many as 20, as few as 11, to force a recorded vote on anything. That's a, it's a lot easier to get 20 members than it is 41. And they don't want to vote. And you can force votes on anything. And you can't control who's recognized on the floor of the Senate because of the vice president. People forget this. Senators forget this. They, they can't pick their speaker like the House can. And so they have chosen not to give the vice president the authority to pick and choose who to recognize. And because of those two things, which are rooted in the Constitution and cannot be nuked by a majority party, the minority will always possess an ability to retaliate. And as long as that is there and they are determined to use it, I believe that a majority will not be able to find the votes to go nuclear. Right. I mean, fundamentally, the Senate is a chamber that operates best by consensus. Uh, they do a lot of business by unanimous consent and they make the effort to reach accommodations with each other. Uh, now, that has grown harder because the parties have grown farther apart politically. I think each side views an agreement with the other as much more difficult to reach and requiring greater policy sacrifices than it did in the past. Um, but James is right. It's, uh, you know, that is still fundamentally the nature of the Senate. It's very hard to run the chamber without having an agreement from the other side. And, uh, you know, there are no easy answers to bridging these partisan divides we see today. We're running out of time, but I did want to touch on one more issue. When the Senate lowers the threshold for things like executive branch appointments, are they ceding some of their power? Are they kind of undercutting the separation of powers and giving the executive branch more power? Absolutely. Look, uh, the, the advice and consent clause gives the Senate a co-equal role in the process, in the assumption, and we saw this from many on the right in 2000, I keep going back to 2003, 4, and 5, where they would, went so far as to say that the judicial filibuster was unconstitutional. The Senate has the authority over its rules. It can set those however it wants. But I would say more broadly, the idea of judicial independence and the separation of powers depends on a strong Senate. Because without it, you're basically handing over to the president, um, assuming that his co-partisans in the Senate will just vote for whoever he puts up most times, the ability to, to, to put whomever on the bench. And at the end of the day, that's going to render the that's going to undermine the separation of powers and it will undermine uh, judicial independence. Well, this is a really fascinating conversation. Who knew the filibuster was going to be in the news so much this year? But uh, there we have it. James Walner, Peter Hansen, thanks so much for being here. We appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Happy to be here. And thanks also to our listeners for tuning in. If you're not already, we encourage you to subscribe to Banter on iTunes or the podcast player of your choice. And while you're there, leave us a rating. We also encourage you to send your questions for our new segment, Ask an AEI Scholar, to banter at aei.org. If your question is chosen, we'll read it on the air and have an AEI Scholar respond to it on the next episode. We'll be back next week, but until then, for James Walner, Peter Hansen, and Cece Gallagly, this is Spencer Moore signing off. Spencer Moore.